we're going to go over what reduced row echelon form of a matrix is. We'll also contrast it with plain row echelon form of a matrix. We'll see some examples and non-examples and finish by showing how to transform a matrix into its reduced row echelon form. Chapters in the description if you want to skip around the video. The reduced row echelon form of a matrix is like row echelon form, but stricter. I'll leave a link in the description to my lesson going over row echelon form. Let's just begin by covering what a matrix matrix needs to be in row echelon form, and then we'll see the additional restriction that it needs to be in reduced row echelon form. So to be in row echelon form, a matrix must have the following properties. If a row doesn't consist entirely of zeros, then the first number in the row has to be a 1. Secondly, any row of all zeros must be at the bottom of the matrix. And finally, in any two successive rows that do not consist entirely of zeros, the leading one in the lower row occurs farther to the right than the leading one in the higher row. If a matrix has these three properties, it is in row echelon form. I should add that some definitions will not include this first restriction. They'll allow the leading entry to be something other than one for row echelon form. But regardless, in reduced row echelon form, the leading entries have to be ones. So not a big deal for our topic today. This is an example of a matrix that's in row echelon form. We can see that any row not consisting entirely of zeros has one as its leading entry. Again, some definitions would allow other numbers here, like instead of one, we could have a three there. And by some definitions, that would still be row echelon form. But regardless, for reduced row echelon form, we will need the these leading entries to be all ones by any definition. Uh, the second property we see, all zero rows are at the bottom of the matrix. We got this row of all zeros, it's at the bottom. And in any two successive rows that aren't entirely zeros, row one and row two in this case, the leading one in the lower row is further to the right than the leading one in the above row. So you get a sort of staircase pattern. Also, row echelon form of a matrix is not unique. A matrix may have multiple row echelon forms, which is a big difference from reduced row echelon form. So let's talk about that. The reduced row echelon form of a matrix is unique. And for a matrix to be in reduced row echelon form, for starters, it must be in row echelon form, so it must have these three properties. And then to be in reduced row echelon form, it must have this fourth property, that each column containing a leading one has zeros in all its other entries. The row echelon form matrix we saw before, for example, is not in reduced row echelon form because it has a column, column two, that contains a leading one but that doesn't have zeros in all its other entries because it has this two up here. But if we subtracted two copies of row two from row one, we would get this matrix that is in reduced row echelon form. It has all the properties of row echelon form, but it also has this fourth property that each column containing a leading one has zeros elsewhere. I want to stress that a matrix, remember, is different from its reduced row echelon form. There are two different matrices, but there are some properties of a matrix that can be indicated to us quickly by the reduced row echelon form, like the rank of the matrix, for example. Or, if the matrix is representing a system of linear equations, the reduced row echelon form can tell us the solution. For example, if this reduced row echelon form matrix was an augmented matrix actually representing a system of linear equations, it would tell us immediately that x1 must equal 7 and our second variable x2 must equal negative 2. You can see how useful it is. And here's a useful little figure of examples and non-examples from Howard Anton's elementary linear algebra text. With any real numbers substituted for the stars, so the stars here just represent any real number, these matrices are all in row echelon form. Notice you've got like a leading one in this column and you're allowed to have any real number you want above it. You've got a leading one in this column. You're allowed to have any real number you want above it. But it does fit the criteria of row echelon form. Zero rows are at the bottom of these matrices, and all the leading entries are ones, and so on. 
You also see the distinctive staircase pattern, where the leading entries are all further to the right than the leading entries above them. And then these matrices are all in reduced row echelon form. For reduced row echelon form, any leading one, any column with a leading one, has to have zeros everywhere else. This column here, for example, doesn't have a leading one, so it's allowed to have any real number it wants right there, whereas this column does have a leading one, so it's got to have zeros everywhere else. To transform a matrix into its row echelon form, we complete what might be considered a forward process, getting zeros below all of the leading ones, which you can see in these matrices. There's a bunch of zeros below the leading ones. Then you need to complete a backwards process to get it in reduced row echelon form, where you go and introduce zeros above the leading ones as well. And that's what we see here, zeros above the leading ones. Let's see that process in action and carry it out ourselves. Every matrix can be transformed into reduced row echelon form by a sequence of elementary row operations, and this process is called Gauss-Jordan elimination. I'll show you how we do it with this matrix A. We'll turn it into reduced row echelon form. I'll leave a link in the description to a more in-depth lesson on Gauss-Jordan elimination. I'll go through it fairly quickly here. Here are all the steps we'll have to take. Let's walk through it. First, we want to get a leading one in row one. So we multiply row one by a half. Then we want to use this leading one to get zeros below it. So we subtract four copies of row one from row two to turn that four to a zero and subtract one copy of row one from row three to turn that one into a zero. But then we have this zero row that isn't at the bottom. So we swap rows two and three to turn that zero row down to the bottom. Then we have a leading entry here in row two that we want to be a one. So we multiply row two by two thirds. That brings us here. We are now in row echelon form, but we're not in reduced row echelon form because we have this column that contains a leading one, but doesn't have zeros elsewhere. This is where we would start what's called the backwards process of introducing zeros above the leading ones. In this case, there's only one step to accomplish that. We subtract three copies of row two from row one to get rid of that three. And that brings us here. We are in reduced row echelon form. We have zeros above and below the leading ones. And of course, all other necessary properties are fulfilled as well. If you know what the rank of a matrix is, the fact that we have two non-zero rows here indicates that our original matrix had a rank of two. And if our original matrix was representing a linear system of equations, then this reduced row echelon form would tell us immediately the solution. X1 is equal to three, and and x2 is equal to negative two-thirds. Again, our matrix A is different from its reduced row echelon form, but the reduced row echelon form of A is unique and tells us a lot of interesting things about A. Since the reduced row echelon form of a matrix is unique, it's also sometimes called the canonical form of the matrix. And that's what reduced row echelon or canonical forms of matrices are. I hope you found this a useful introduction. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and if you find these linear algebra lessons helpful, please consider supporting Wrath of Math on Patreon. It's a huge help. Link in the description.